Hello everyone, thank you for tuning in to the Creative Council. My name is Natasha, and today um, we're gonna be talking about the topic of fantasy and really how to overcome the images or the image or imaginary spouse that we create in our heads or imaginary boyfriend, girlfriend, dream person, whatever you wanna call it, um, and the need to deal with that. <laughs> And why it's necessary to deal with that, especially before you get into marriage, because um, that can be problematic on the other side of it. Um, and even if you are in marriage, it's you know a tool that you can use to um, go deeper in intimacy with your partner and with the Lord, honestly, and just uh, not have any barriers stopping you from being great. <laughs> so anyhow, um, so I titled it "Lost in Fantasy: Overcoming and Divorcing the." you know, imaginary spouse, alluring images, and romanticized fantasies. And so that's a mouthful, but I'm going to break it down. So what do I mean when I say like a ma uh, the alluring image and the romanticized image? So there are, you know, men and women, we struggle with, in, uh, internally I'm talking, we struggle with these ideas and um, thoughts of how, about how we have, that we have about people and how they should be in our minds. And a lot of times that can become and often becomes a snare because who we see in our head is not necessarily who we end up with at the altar. And then there is friction because we have this idea of how this person should be and the reality of who they are doesn't match. So that, be, that creates uh, problems and friction, like I said. And so with the women, you know, a lot of times it's going to be, it's going to be the romanticized image. That was, that's what women struggle with. And man is going to be the alluring image or the seductive in, image or whatnot. And I'm going to break both of those down uh, right here, but both of them are created within the soul and are um, generated in our mind. And so, you know, your soul comprises of your mind, will, emotions, images, pictures, um, desires, all these, it can, it's a whole little gamut. I should do a video about that, actually uh, going into detail of what the soul consists of. But anyhow, I digress. <laughs> so this is where these images are usually held. And they're not going to be necessarily in the forefront of your mind all the time. They're going to be, um, they're going to be in your heart. So your heart mind, like, because it's in the soul, which is, kind of like in science, you have your frontal lobe and then you have the mid, mid brain, they're going to be in the middle. So they're not going to be something that's not, that's necessarily always at the forefront of your mind. It'll be like catch you off guard while you're daydreaming or, you know, you're in, or when you're dreaming, stuff like that. So what is a romanticized image? So that is, I would like to like compare it to, so when I was growing up, they had like these novels and even now they have those you know romantic novels and they're like really thick and they have these stories about you know woman a woman a woman finding love and all these detailed you know situations that happen within the journey up to that and a lot of time it has a lot of sexual details and so it really gets into the mind of a person to picture and imagine what's happening in the book and going there if you will and when I was growing up, they, those were really popular and, you know, back in the uh, 90s uh, and early uh, 2000s or whatnot. And even when I remember watching on TV that I always associated this image or this person, this idea with for a woman is that guy from I Can't Believe It's Not Butter commercials. He was like, I think his name was like Fabio, Fabio or something like that. And he was like bronzy and blonde hair and I guess people's dream guy, whatever. But that that's the kind of idea, you know, I usually get when I think about, you know, a, 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 a romanticized image or whatnot that comes into the head. But it doesn't have to be, I'm just trying to give you a, gra a, a, a something to grasp, but it usually is going to be your, you know, your dream man, your dream guy, and you know, where you're having these thoughts and, you know, oh, how your spouse is going to be and he's just going to be dreamy and he's going to be, you know, y'all are going to be taking walks on the beach and on your honeymoon, you're going to just enjoy each other and go at it several times a day. And, you know, um, he's going to just be so sweet and kissing you passionately all the time or, you know, whatever your fantasies are, it's just, this is that guy. 
<laughs> this is the guy that makes up and that fulfills your fantasies when it comes to what you believe romance is and what it should be. And that is usually not based in reality or truth, um, unfortunately. And, you know, I have to come to that harsh reality. That's why I could say it so freely. And um, But it's, it's, it's something that has to be dealt with because what happens is when we think of people and um, like I said before, and then they don't meet it, meet what we have built in our head, then we end up broken or disappointed or wanting to exit a relationship or, you know, blaming the other person when it really was us because we have this unrealistic expectation to put them on a, a pedestal in our mind. So it's just kind of important to deal with, I think. And um, so for a woman, it's that romanticized image. And, you know, a man is not, he's not going to be... <laughs> you know, everything you imagine him to be like, that is, you want to get delivered from that on the other side of marriage, not while you're in it. You know, it's really important because, you know, when he, when he gets off work, he's not going to be wanting to be all cutty, busting through the door with roses and cards and, oh, honey, how was your day? And, oh, you know, you cooked him a meal and now y'all are going to go lay down and you're just going to go into the room and ride them into the sunset. Like, that's not, no. It's going to be, you know, you waking up in the morning, the reality of it, going, you waking up in the morning and him taking a dump, leaving the door open and letting it fly into the, you know, room and feeling it and, you know, farting and all of that jazz on you. And so it's not, <laughs> I'm saying this because we need a reality check. Like is marriage is so, is so little of it is, you know, sex and, you know, that part of it, most of it is communication and, um, you know, doing and going through life, the mundane and y'all not going to be humping each other all day. So I think this idea that we have within our minds of who and what a man should be and look like, um, and this is just, I'm not even talking about the, you know, the man that has been shaped by culture today, which is, you know, the emasculated man who is just basically has no levels and just walks around, you know, being ran by a woman and it's just completely out of order anyway. But so this is just dealing with, uh, you know, traditionally what women uh, deal with, um, or at least anyone, woman that's not a narcissist. So... Um, and even then, you know, it's even worse. It's much, much worse. And so it's important to kind of, you know, look at that and examine your own heart. But anyhow, so that is usually what women deal with is that romanticized image we have in our mind of how he's going to be and he's just going to be this and that and, you know, do all these things. And it's always centered me, 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 I, I, I. And when it doesn't happen, we are devastated. So that is, um usually what women do it. So when I say the alluring, I'm going to move on to men because I know how people, oh, you need to invent the men. Okay, so well, man, the alluring image they, is something they do, which is basically uh, the seductive image that tries, uh, that ties itself to someone's attraction or fascination. So when I say that, it's, you know, it's the image that men usually will have of a woman that's not real. So yeah, you can have to imagine in your mind, like, oh, my wife's going to be bomb. Like, she's going to have, you know, a snatched waist and have a big booty and big boobs. And she's going to be cooking for me every, you know, day and, you know, fulfilling my every sexual desire and, you know, all these different things and worshiping you, basically. So, it's that's just, no. <laughs> that is setting you up, sir, for failure. And that is not reality. And, um... Like I said, you know, even with, with the woman, with the man, like your wife is not going to be like, even if she is, uh, you know, has those, has a really nice body in the beginning of marriage, like she's going to be popping out your big headed kids. She's going to be, you know, you're going to put some mouths on her and, you know, so she's not going to necessarily look like how you started. And if you're vain and selfish and, uh, you know, you have this idea of how she should be. And this pedestal, when she doesn't meet it, that is going to um, create a, a, a disdain in your heart towards her. And so that's why I'm saying it's very important for us to deal with this stuff. Like people may think it's like, oh, you know, whatever. But no, this manifests, it's part of, it's in your heart. So it will manifest in marriage if you don't deal with it. And you, you cannot deal with, you know, just go along about your business, whatever. And, you know, and 
no, don't question or wonder why your marriages or your relationships always fail or someone always leaves you because you're selfish. And you have these unrealistic expectations in marriage or in your relationships. And so they, they can't meet it and you can't meet theirs. Like that's why I'm saying it's, it's really looking, taking an honest look at your heart and seeing where these things lie and where they are. Cause like I said, both of them are created in the soul, but they're both faith in selfishness and really idolatry. So what is, how do you, how do you even deal with that? Like, how do you overcome these images and overcome these ideas? Because one of the things you have to realize too, is it's not just the image of the person that you have in your mind. It's the belief systems you have about that image in your mind. So, it's not just a face, but it's a whole system tied to that. And so when you have that, it's, it's, it's really hard if that has not been confronted because it's, it's, a, it's a stronghold. It becomes a stronghold. So for instance, like, you know, when the uh, Bible talks about, you know, you have to bind the strong man and then you plunder his house. Well, so the strong man is usually, and, and a lot of times these images will be connected to a spirit. Um, because that's it, the enemy will not waste the opportunity to invade someone's life. And if you have open doors and you can see that pride and selfishness in you, he's going to take that and um, take it to the bank and cash it. So a lot of times it will be tied to a spirit or something, you know, of that nature. But that's just a strong man. So even if you're just dealing with the spirit, you get delivered, you go to the altar and you get delivered or whatever from spirit spouse or whatever that may be. You deal with the strong man, but you still have to deal with the house. And the house is the system. The house is the belief system. The house is the functionality and the uh, the way you have been thinking that have created pathways in your mind and in your heart that have to be undone and have to be renewed by the word and by the truth. And so even just dealing with the image or the, the spirit is not enough. You have to deal with the belief system behind it. Because it's just like, for instance, if you have a house and you know you have someone who was there and they you you know you kick them out you like whatever get your you know get your stuff and get out if they still have stuff in their in your house um they still have legal rights and access so a lot of times people will get delivered from stuff and then it comes back because they still have their their possessions you know you still have their possessions in your house so they have legal rights to their possessions because you still have it so there is a process. It's not just one and done, you know, go to the altar, you know, you shout your wig off and then, you know, get up. Oh Lord, thank you. No, there's a, you have to do the work. And a lot of times people want, people want God to deliver them from stuff he wants us to overcome. And there's a difference. Deliverance is, you know, that can be instantaneously, instantaneously. Like you can be delivered instantly from an, an addiction. You can be delivered instantly from, you know, a, a infirmity. But the system and the way of thinking, or for instance, like you've been delivered from a spirit of poverty, but if you still have an impoverished mindset and a way of thinking and belief systems, it doesn't matter because that thing is going to come back and worse. You have to deal with the belief system. And that's the overcoming part because a lot of people, a lot of Christians are lazy and they want other people to do their work, to go get their demons out. And then they can go along about their little marriage business or whatnot. And just, you know, if they get, you know, if they feel they get another demon, whatever, they'll just go get it cast out instead of doing the work to actually um, maintain deliverance and advance in their life and advance in maturity to grow. They want other people to do it for them. They want the Lord to do it for them. And he's not. Like, that's why he said, you have to renew your mind. He didn't say, I'm going to renew your mind. No, it's you. It's you that have to do the work for it. And a lot of people don't want to because they're lazy. And um, and that's just the, the honest truth, unfortunately. And that's why we are in the situation we are in, in society, um, in the church, because people are lazy and they want everybody to do something. They want the pastor to do it for them. No, you have to do the work for yourself. And so in the same way, you know, Jesus didn't, put those thoughts in your head, you know, and a lot of times the thoughts are not yours, but you didn't take them captive. And so that's what I want to get into next. Like, how do you overcome? Like, what's the antidote to this? How do you overcome these images and this, you know, the romanticized image and alluring images um, that you may struggle with in their fantasy? Well, you need to submit your thought life to God and make him Lord over your thought life and have adopt 
and adapt the mind of Christ. You can say you have it, but to, until you actually adapt it and make it practical, then it's... So, taking your thought captives, like, um, is very important. But before that, one of the things you're going to want to do is get to know wisdom. <laughs> like, you need you some wisdom. Wisdom will have your whole life in order. Like, for real. Like, the, the book of Proverbs is a whole life lesson. <laughs> so, wisdom is going to keep you. And um, So, it says, like, in Proverbs 2, Then you will understand righteousness and judgment and equity in every good path. Every good path. When wisdom enters your heart, remember, your mind, your heart and your mind are connected. When, it, when wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, which is your mind, will, and emotions... Discretion will preserve you. Understanding will keep you to deliver you from the way of the evil man, that romanticized image, from the one who speaks perverse things, from those who leave the paths of righteousness and walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil and delight in perversity in the wicked and of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and who are devious in their paths to deliver you from the immoral woman. So right there, that's your antidote. Wisdom is the principal thing. Understanding and all that comes with wisdom. So wisdom is not just a idea or philosophy or something that is like, oh, this is a, you know, uh, something that's not tangible. Wisdom is a spirit. It's a person. She is a person. And the spirit of wisdom, which is outlined clearly in the scriptures and Proverbs and in, uh, what is it, J uh, Isaiah 11, 1, talks about the seven spirits of God. Wisdom is one of those spirits. And if you think that there are, you know, only Jesus, Holy Spirit, and Father God and angels, you're sadly mistaking, mistaken. And uh, there are, God has created so many different beings, but um, usually it's uh, mature people who are mature in the Lord who under can come into that understanding. But anyhow, wisdom will get your whole life in order. So wisdom, there are paths, like the word outlines of righteousness, equity, judgment, and um, in the good way. So if you're walking in wisdom, or if you applied wisdom to your life, she will keep you from the immoral woman. And this whole dialogue between uh, wisdom, the, the, uh, the person who walks in wisdom and a person who walks in the ways of the immoral wo woman, you'll see the difference there, the parallel there. Same with the evil man, the wicked man. She'll keep you from the wicked man. So you think about the, the, the and the thing about it is, because it says the paths of darkness. So the evil man is uh, leads you in the way of path of darkness. Well, it's not going to be something that's just suddenly like, just like you won't boom, turn the lights on and bam, the darkness is gone. So it says that it le he leads you in the way of darkness. It's not going to be something that's extremely just sudden. It's going to be progressive. First, it's going to start dimming. The light will dim, dim, dim. Suddenly you're on a path of darkness. It's the same way as this image, these um, romanticized images and um, alluring images. At first, it's like innocent. You know, you can have a thought of a guy, you know, with a shirt off, you know, and you're not even thinking about a dude. You just, you know, you're sitting there trying to bake, bake chocolate chip cookies. And then boom, this thought comes in your head of a guy with a shirt off. And you're like, uh, okay, that was, you know, weird. And then so now you're thinking your imagination will do the work for you. Don't, don't, don't sleep on the imagination. It will do the work for you. And now you're touching his chest. And now, you know, y'all, next thing you know, you're on a train to right on the train with the guy riding him through, you know, whatever. And you done took off and you're like, how did I even get there? You didn't take that thought captive. So not every thought that comes to your head is yours, but like I said, wisdom is the principal thing. Wisdom will get you right. So engaging and asking God, the Lord said, if anyone lacks wisdom, ask and he will give liberally. And so that is something you need to ask the Lord to, to give you because she will keep you, like I said, from foolishness and ways of darkness and wickedness. And then you're going to want us, like I said before, take those thoughts captive. Like it talks about in uh, 2 Corinthians 10, uh, verse 5. Um, it says, for the weapon of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down every argument and high thing high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity, captivity to the obedience of Jesus. 
So every high thing, anything that is not in the mind of Christ, anything that is outside him. So you need to bring it into captivity. So you need to take that thought captive. So what does that even look like? Um, so instantly when you have a thought or these images or whatever, just reject it. Don't accept it. Like, no. So that practice, I would just say, no, I interrupt that thought, you know? And so in the name of Jesus, I reject that thought. That is not mine. I will not allow, I will not permit it. I reject it. I bind it up and I cast it down and I will, and you replace it with the word of God. I will think on whatever is noble, whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is peaceable, whatever, whatever is excellent, whatever is lovely. I will think about these things, Philippians 4, 8. So that's how you're combating it. You know, you combat it with the word of God. You wa you wage war with the word. It's a sword. It's a hammer. It is going to work if you work it. So like I said, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. Like you've been, you've, you spent a lot of time building up these thoughts and these paths in your mind, these neurological pathways in your mind and ways of thinking and belief systems, it will have to be torn. It's not going to be torn down overnight. It's going to take work. That's why you need to work out your salvation. You have to work at it. So, but it's worth it. And at first it may seem like a lot and overwhelming, but the more you work it, the more it's going to work for you. And the less, less those paths, those paths are being swept away and being coming into alignment with the word of God. And now you're renewing your mind with the word of God. So your mind is actually being renewed unto the word of God. And if there is a demonic uh, an entity attacked, attached to it, which usually it is, then you can just take, bind that up and light them up. Like take the thought captive. I bind anything associated with this thought that would try to enforce it on my mind and my heart. And I call the fire of God on you for you to be tortured and tormented before your time. Guess what? They gonna stop because they're going to go look for a weaker Christian. They're going to go look for someone who's weak. And who won't stand up and who won't, they're not expecting you to, to clap back. So when you clap back, they're going to back off eventually, but don't back off of them. So you resist the devil and he will flee. So, you know, you better, what is it? James four, seven, that joker and resist him and he will flee. So that's just a practical way that I have, um, implement. And like I said, the more you do it, the less it will happen. And the more you have so much peace in your heart and in your mind, not just with the erotic image and, uh, the romantic, uh, the, um, rom alluring and a romanticized image with everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ, not just, you, you know, pictures, but words. And I want you to think about something too, because you know, people may say, Oh, that'd be challenging. Well, I want you to literally in your mind, count to 10, count to 10. Okay, now start saying your ABCs out loud. Say your ABCs. What happened? So when you are counting in your head, and then I said, say your ABCs out loud, what happened? That thought got interrupted by your words. So when you speak the word of God, you're going to interrupt and interact with that thought and interrupt it and disrupt it with the word and truth and dismantle it. So the more you do that, the less it's going to be frequent in your life. So it's really important is what I'm saying, because I mean, a lot of people struggle with this and not just this, but just things in their mind in general. But anyways, I just wanted to come on and, and, and talk about this because it's, it's, it's something God has helped me overcome. And um, that's how you really get your victory. Um, it's not necessarily always getting delivered from something that's really going through the process of overcoming. The last thing you want to do are, um, uh, those are just practical applications. Like I said, with Ephesians 4, 8 and uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, but you want to break agreement with that, with those images. So you want to come out of agreement and repent, you know, be honest with like, he already know, like he sees it. Like, don't try to hide, just be real with Jesus. He's going to be real with you. So be real with him. Like he already sees it. So break agreement and come out of agreement with it. So what does that even look like? So father, I just repent. I come before you and I say, and I own the fact that I've had struggles with these images, um, unrealistic expectation that I've placed on, you know, my relationships or on my spouse or whatever in the past, even on, you know, you on how I think you should be. I come out of agreement with that. I repent and I own and acknowledge it as sin and I repent and I turn away from it. I don't want anything to do with that. I, I turn away and I renounce that in Jesus name and I break agreement and covenant 
that I've made with that image and those ideas and the systems behind it. I want to come out of agreement with it. I ask that your blood will be applied to anything that I've uh, allowed myself to come into agreement with, with ignorantly and knowingly. I apply the blood of Jesus to break every contract, every demonic contract, every demonic uh, uh, covenant I've, I forged. I break that by the power of the blood of Jesus. I renounce those ties and I sever every soul tie to every image, every picture, every spirit and demonic associated with those images and pictures. I break agreement with you and I break your power out of, off of my life by the blood of Jesus. And I renounce you in Jesus name. And I redeem my life and my my images and my imagination and my mind to Yahweh. And I declare, I have the mind of Christ, whatever is lovely, whatever is pure. I will think on these things, Lord. I thank you for them. And I thank you, God, that I will set my mind on things above, not things on that, that are beneath and carnal, but on what is what, what you have ordained for me, what you have set for me in Jesus name. So it's as simple as that. Like it don't have to be hard, you know, I mean, the work, you don't have to do the work as far as when it comes up, but don't overcomplicate it. Like, just be confident and walk in your authority. You got it. And God's got you most importantly. Anyways, I hope this video has been helpful. I just want to come on and share some practic practical um, tips on how to really overcome that and um, acknowledging it and what God has showed me in um, being victorious in that area. So, anyhow... If this helped you, don't forget to like and subscribe and share. Share it with someone who might need it because, you know, people, you never know. So, or maybe you do know people who struggle with that. And you're like, oh, girl, or do you need to listen to this? So, but anyhow, I hope you are blessed. Thank you so much again for listening. And until next time, be healed, be whole, be free. Bye.